are listening to Ohio V, the world, an Ohio history podcast. The only podcast dedicated exclusively to the history of the Buckeye State. Subscribe to the show on iTunes and Stitcher. And don't forget to rate and review us. Join the conversation now at Facebook. Stream and donate to the show at OhioVTheWorldPodcast.com. Now, here's your host, Alex Hasty. It's hard to tell. Hey guys, welcome back. It's season two, episode one of Ohio V the World. The world's only Ohio history podcast. We're so glad you're back with us. Uh, so glad to have some of our former listeners jumping back on. And hello to all the new listeners. It's great to have you. Uh, don't forget to rate and review the show on iTunes. You can do it on your cell phone when you're listening right now. Uh, it means a lot to us. It helps us jump up in the rankings. We've already gotten so much higher than we were when we first started out last March. We're so glad you're joining us again. And let's get started right away. Today, our guest is the host of one of my favorite podcasts called My History Can Beat Up Your Politics. It's a, it's a political podcast that looks at the history of politics in this country. Uh, and the host is Bruce Carlson. Bruce has joined us today. He also joined us for a later episode we're doing this season. And he is just a wealth of knowledge. You got to find his show on iTunes or wherever. Again, My History Can Beat Up Your Politics. Or just go to the website, MyHistoryCanBeatUpYourPolitics.com. All the episodes are there. You can just click on one. Um, and he is just awesome. He's one of my favorites. I'm so, so honored that he would join the show. Uh, much appreciated. Today, guys, we are talking about one of the most monumental and important decisions in human history. We are talking about the dropping of the atom bomb on Hiroshima, Japan, on August 6, 1945. Today, we're going to take you back to 1945, to the context and the political environment and the war environment that that decision was made by President Harry Truman. And we're going to talk about today, the subject of today's show, Columbus's own Paul Tibbetts, Colonel Paul Tibbetts. Colonel Tibbetts was the pilot of the Enola Gay, the B-29 bomber that dropped the atom bomb, little boy, on the unsuspecting Empire of Japan ultimately beginning the process that would end the war barely a week later. When I was a kid, and this is a weird story, but it's true. When I was a kid, I grew up in the Cold War. I was a Cold War kid. And I was always worried about the threat of thermonuclear war, the threat of the world ending, that the Russians, the Soviets would bomb us. I would sneak downstairs some nights, sleep downstairs on the couch, So I would be the last one to die when the Russians attacked. It's pretty messed up. We don't think about it as much anymore. Even with North Korea and President Trump and Kim Jong-un going back and forth, it's still not at the forefront of what we think about today. People like my mom and, and my dad, they used to do duck and cover drills when they were in school. Like hiding under your desk and covering your head was gonna save you from a you know from a hydrogen bomb blast. We don't think about it as much, but it's still there. And it permeates over everything. It's in the background all the time. The major powers of the world have nuclear weapons pointed at each other 24 hours a day. From missile silos and planes and nuclear subs. It's amazing to me that something hasn't gone wrong in the last 65, 75 years since this event. We haven't had another explosion in a population. Colonel Paul Tibbetts, the subject of today's show, carried this with him the rest of his life. He said he never let it bother him. We'll hear from him about that. He thinks that he saved hundreds of thousands of Japanese and American lives by dropping that bomb, by warding off what would have been an inevitable mainland invasion of of the country of Japan by the United States. This is someone who killed 140,000 people with one mission, with one flight. Like I said, we're going to go back and get into all of that in the spring, summer of 1945. The question we're going to look at is, did we have to do it? Did it really save lives? Or could we have gotten the Japanese to surrender without using it? We'll talk to Bruce Carlson about all that. 
We'll hear from President Truman. We'll hear from Paul Tibbetts, the pilot of the Enola Gay himself. Just a couple quick announcements. We have our season two launch party uh, two days from today on Saturday, November 18th. It's going to be held in Grandview at the Columbus Italian Club. Uh, there's no admission. It's free. There's food. There's drinks. Jesse Henry is going to be playing from the Spike Drivers. He's going to be playing a bunch of Tom Petty songs. We lost Tom Petty uh, since we last were with you. One of my favorite rock stars. So glad I saw him two times in 2017, including with Miss Ohio V the World when we saw him at Red Rocks out in Denver. Just an amazing uh, Memorial Day for us. Um, but Jesse's going to be there to play some of our favorite songs. Um, we'll have food provided by our friends of the Berwick Manor. Incredible Italian food. They cater my wedding. They're just absolutely amazing out in uh, East Columbus, uh, right off a of refugee road. Um, they'll be there. They'll have awesome food for us. It's going to be catered. We'll also have our beer, which is also our beer for the episode, but our friend Dan Cochran and the folks at Four String Brewing are going to be providing all the beer, uh, and we'll be raising money for the charity, the scholarship that will start this spring uh, that we're giving away to high school seniors for, for college. You're going to do an audio and video essay contest, and we're going to give away money this, and we're going to raise some money on Saturday. So if you listen to the show, you don't have any plans on Saturday, everyone's invited. Bring your friends. We'll see you. Uh, check out the invite on Facebook. Go to our Facebook page, Ohio V the World, for all your info. Our beer for the episode, our first beer of the episode for season two, we got to give it to our boys, Four String Brewing in Grandview on 6th Avenue. They got an awesome tap room. It's just there a couple weeks ago. Uh, my friend Colin Gowell's playing every Thursday night um, from Watershed, a very famous early 90s Columbus band. Um, and they just have all their beers and other beers on tap. Uh, it's a great place. So go check them out, fourstringbrewing.com. Today, while we record, we are drinking one of their flagship beers, Brass Knuckle, American Pale Ale. It's a great American PA. Golden, kind of an orangish yellow, uh, 5.75% American Pale Ale. It's got those citrusy aromas that I like, um, but it's just a really solid beer. Our friend Dan Cochran, thanks again for for uh, helping us get you know the beer for the episode and the beer for the launch party. So we can't wait to see everybody on Saturday, November 18th. Anyone who was at the Season 1 launch party, I know you won't miss it. Also, we got some great local press this week. Check out the Columbus Alive Wrote an awesome article by Erica Thompson about our new season, and we're releasing shows Saturday and Monday this week. But let's get started. We're so excited to have Bruce Carlson with us. Again, check out his podcast, My History Can Beat Up Your Politics. Um, he just did an amazing episode with Chris Matthews of MSNBC talking about uh, Robert F. Kennedy. Um, just a really cool show, and Bruce really knows his stuff, and I can't wait for all my listeners to start listening to him. Uh, and just see how great of a show that he has. My history can beat up your politics. Enough of my season premiere ramblings, because it's time to learn how I stopped worrying and learned to love episode one, Ohio vs. the Bomb. first episode, we're going to take you back to 1945, one of the most consequential years of the 20th century. And we're going to take you back to the role of Paul Tibbetts of Columbus, Ohio, in the sudden end of World War II. In the spring of 1945, in March, we see the firebombing of Tokyo. Round-the-clock bombings set the entire city ablaze. Over 100,000 Japanese citizens are killed over a three-day period in Tokyo. The city is reduced to rubble. The United States Army and the Marines are moving island to island, battling in just absolutely terrible, terrible fights against an entrenched, underground, in some cases, fanatical, fight-you-to-the-death Japanese. These battles on places like Okinawa and Hiwa Jima are claiming, uh, at Okinawa, we see 110,000 Japanese soldiers die. Some 20,000 Americans casualties. These are fights for small islands, landing strips, in the mountains. 
that are taking weeks at a time. And the fighting is the worst it's ever been. In Europe, Germany is reeling. Fighting a war on both sides, Hitler's empire, the Third Reich, is crumbling. In March, in April, the end is near. Everyone can see that. Even Hitler sees that. He'll kill himself in his bunker in early, April, in early May. But as the war in Europe winds down in the spring of 45, the war in the Pacific is only intensifying. Like we said, on places like Okinawa, the United States is beginning to make plans for a mainland invasion of Japan. We talked to Bruce Carlson about the changing war in the Pacific, how Japanese tactics had gotten more desperate and even more violent in the spring of 1945. That, that Pacific fighting throughout that war is a lot harder than some of the textbook history might have it seem. And we were island hopping. It involved, you know, for each gain to be made, you had to have a significant naval fleet. We were always in uh, danger of our fleets being wrecked or ruined. And by the time you're getting to 1944, where we are able to start to turn our attention just on Japan alone, and we have made significant gains, we start seeing a new tactic. And that is the kamikaze raids, you know, planes just crashing into American ships, which enough of that and, and it will sink the vessel, no matter how well they might be defending against an, an attack from the air. Having the whole plane come crashing down is not something that right. we were prepared for. There was, a, there was a noted tenacity in some of the later battles that American soldiers were conveying, that the military brass was conveying. And it became pretty clear that we were not just dealing with an enemy at war, but perhaps a fanatical enemy. And I think that played a big role in decision making. The Americans had, an, obviously, a strong hatred for Nazi Germany for Mussolini and the Italians, but they saved a special type of vitriol, a special deep-down hatred for the Japanese. We were attacked by the Japanese at Pearl Harbor, December 7, 1941. They had caught us off guard. Their tactics were brutal. Things like the Bataan Death March, the rape of Nanking. They were barbaric. The way that they would slaughter wounded Americans. The things that they did, the testing... Just awful things that the Japanese did. The American people hated the Japanese. I mean, how more... We didn't intern German Americans, yet over 100,000 Japanese Americans were sent away to camps, internment camps, throughout most of the Western United States. And what was certainly one of the ugliest episodes in American history. We asked Bruce why, why we had seemed to have more hatred for the Japanese than we did for Hitler and the Germans. I think from the American side, the first thing to understand about the point of view of most Americans, and this is the military, the soldiers, uh, the, the brass, the political operators, as well as the American public, is never to forget that we've always felt, and we were, attacked, we were attacked first. And that was a surprise attack. Uh, that That's not what Germany did to us, even though Germany was an, an enemy and we certainly wanted uh, to see Hitler dead or prosecuted and all of the, the Nazis prosecuted for their crimes. J Japan, at the time we're talking about, had this greater emotional um, uh, uh, you know, component in, in our decision-making. I can't tell you how stoked we were when Bruce Carlson responded to our inquiry to have him on the show. Um, he was so giving with his time, spent a couple hours with us Skyping uh, from his home just outside of New York and New Jersey. We asked Bruce, because he's been doing this a long time. I think this is his 11th year of the show, My History Can Beat Up Your Politics. Uh, we asked him just about how he got started um, and his love for history and some of the cool, exciting things he's doing with his show in 2017 and 2018. You know, including he has a premium podcast uh, that we subscribe to, uh, just two dollars a month. Let's talk about my history sure. can beat up your politics. It's one of my favorite uh, history political podcasts. Um, how long have you been actually, po you know, doing the show or just podcasting in general? Started uh, two thousand six. Wow, uh, so you're with in a Radio Shack <laughs> with a Radio Shack microphone <laughs> and. Uh, 
That was back when the iPod looked like, you know, uh, uh, the, the, those giant bulky white yeah. systems that we used to carry around barely could fit in a pocket. Um, and uh, in one point, I was even recording off that device. My technology was so, you know, lo-fi at that point. Uh, and we just have it. I did notice, though, that doing the topic of bringing history to the politics of today, the audience just exploded. Yeah. Uh, the website is www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. But really, it just started uh, iTunes. Were you a history major? How I mean, how'd you get into this oh, stuff? Yeah. <laughs> kind of funny. I'm a lit major. No. Yeah, I just found that when I was in political discussions, I was always bringing up to people, you know, this is not particularly new. Uh, this, this happened before. <laughs> yeah, this happened before. And you do a lot of that in the show, which I love. So, Yes, that's true. Uh, lately, and, and in 2017, we started something new. And that's uh, that I started doing interviews. And that's helped because this is always podcasting, as you probably know, is a little bit of a lonely enterprise. Uh, you're out there and wondering if... Um, you know, anybody's uh, listening or what have you, you know, it's it's like we're all in some radio station out in the Arizona desert or something, wondering right. if anybody's listening or not. But uh, and you get a response and, you know, they do. But this was the first year that we really were able to bring on um, guests and I could kind of fit that in and I felt comfortable doing it. But up until now, for the first 10 years of the program, it has been kind of a lecture format. I take on topics. I researched them thoroughly and i tell stories and that's the best part yeah i mean but you you know you had chris matthews from msnbc last week sydney blumenthal i loved you know we're going to talk kind of about that era today um what was the gentleman two weeks two three weeks ago uh, the aj blame aj blame great guy really energetic yeah and totally into truman yeah and great. he I just researched that. everything This is Ohio v. The World. Every show has an Ohio connection, whether it's an Ohio event, an Ohio person. Um, and today we're talking about Paul Tibbetts, Colonel Paul Tibbetts. He's 30 years old and he's a colonel. It's incredibly young as he's rising up the ranks. He's born in Illinois. He's raised in Illinois and Iowa and Florida. Um, and he eschews his father's plan for him to become a doctor. And he wants to fly planes. And he wants to fight for his country. He's an incredibly punctual guy. Smokes a pipe. Um, and he's asked, after doing a bunch of bombing runs in North Africa and in the European theater, he gets a call in 1944. And they ask him to come to Washington. And he goes and he meets with a general who describes to him the Manhattan Project. The super secret, incredible bomb that the United States is building that could end the war. And they asked Colonel Tibbetts if he would put together a crew, if he would be the one who would get this weapon delivered, if he would fly a B-29, outfit it so that it could handle this kind of payload. They promise he can pick his own team, and he does, the best of the best people that he's worked with. I kind of liken Tibbetts to the, the Bruce Willis character from Armageddon, who picks his entire crew there uh, as they try and go up and, and assault the the meteor that's that's streaking towards uh, streaking towards the Earth, you know. And they ask him if he's ever is there anything in his background? You know, obviously they've done all the research, so he doesn't want to lie. Have you ever been arrested? The guy, the general, asked him in the meeting, and he says he assumes that they know about it. He says, "Well, yes, I was in Florida once. I was on a date and." My date and I got into the back seat, and we were messing around. And next thing I know, a police officer shows up and puts his light in the window. And the guy's like, well, you know, don't worry about that. We didn't know about that. Um, you know, there's no real record of it. Uh, but Tibbetts doesn't tell his family or anything what his mission is. And he starts training out in Utah. It's a huge secret. It's, the code for him was Silver Flake. And with that code word, Paul Tibbetts could get anything he wanted. Planes, material money, whatever he needed, he just had to say Silver Flake. People didn't know what it was, um, but it worked. And in 1944, Tibbetts goes to work for the Manhattan Project. 
Also, you know, another Columbus connection, Battelle Institute, uh, also heavily involved in the building of the bomb here in Columbus. Um, and he goes to work with Robert Oppenheimer, the scientist, and General Leslie Groves. Those two headed up the Manhattan Project, the science of it and the military aspect of it. And after months and months of training, these other guys on the team, very few of them know what, what they're doing. But they're doing training runs where they're dropping one bomb. Back in the war, you dropped dozens and dozens of bombs from a, a B-29, a flying fortress. With all their missions, they're just dropping one giant bomb, a bomb weighing 10,000 pounds. We ask our guest, Bruce Carlson, about the Manhattan Project and how in the world we were able to keep it a secret. It was an incredible secret, and, and I tend to believe that the actual pulling off of it versus maybe at the idea stage uh, was, was something that at that time only America could do. I might be slightly biased with that, but I think that uh, that that it was such a large project and and we were the ones with the capabilities, even if, as I said, there might have been scientists who had various ideas um, to do it. I mean, one of the things that Truman, just to set the stage a bit, says in his diary is that, you know, it is a good thing for the world that the United States has this uh, and not uh, Germany or the Soviet Union. Uh, and uh, this is when he finds out about it. Of course, at this at the time we're talking, when it's being developed, Truman has no idea about it. He doesn't have any idea about it as a senator, even though he's a senator who's investigating all the war operations of the United States. And, and it is a testament to how secret this operation was kept that uh, nobody, nobody really knew of it until it was time to bring it out. On April 12th, 1945, Franklin Delano Roosevelt dies after being president of the United States for 12 years. Our trusted leader, who had gotten us all the way near to the end of the war, he would miss the surrender of Nazi Germany by less than a month, and he'd miss the end of the war by only three months. His replacement is somebody we'll hear from today, Harry S. Truman. The S literally stands for S. From Independence, Missouri the haberdasher, the World War I vet, the everyman who becomes the leader of the free world, and arguably the most powerful man in the world. Truman has no idea about the bomb. On his second day as president, he's told by Secretary of War Henry Stimson that we have a weapon, that it's in the testing phase and could be ready to use as soon as the end of the summer. Truman can't believe it. As a senator, he had poked around some funding, a massive amounts of funding that went into this project. Paul Tibbetts, our, our subject of today, claims it was over $2 billion, a number that Truman would cite also. We asked Bruce about Truman's decision-making process. Did he mull this over? Did he, was he waking up in the middle of the night thinking about whether or not to use this device? The answer is no. We asked Bruce why. I don't really think it was this huge agonizing decision. Truman didn't make those type of decisions, by the way. He was a quick, you know, one of the things he talks about in his diary, he has a meeting with Stalin. Stalin and Molotov are there and, uh, you know, Stalin meets him and Stalin's like, well, I have a few questions for you. And Truman's like, fire away. And they go over a series of agreements between the countries. And Truman was known for quick answers. I don't think he agonized about it at all. I actually think it was part of a more of a military plan, just like we had already engaged in firebombing, which was killing lots of civilians and destroying cities. And uh, while I'm sh he did weigh in and he gave his comments about the using it on the, on the military and he was, he was made aware of all the developments once he became president, you know, this idea that he might have agonized in a room about it, I, I don't think is really how it happened. A uh, president, obviously, who, who had a weapon like this and then didn't use it, and that is definitely the American mindset at that point. With all the generals behind it, with all of the um, uh, the opinions, with with people with their their boys in the Pacific, uh, with the soldiers returning home and not from Europe and not wanting to face the prospect of having to fight two more years yeah, in huge. the Pacific, it's a huge and and we don't even have to have the discussion in a sense because I don't believe there really was much of an agonizing decision or anything like that. The atom bomb is successfully tested in July of 1945 in the New Mexican desert. 
Oppenheimer and Groves are there. Everyone's ecstatic. It worked. They didn't know if it would work. They didn't know if the bombs they dropped later on Hiroshima and Nagasaki would work. And they only had three bombs from what, what we can gather. But the test worked, and they let Truman know. Truman's at Potsdam with, with Stalin and with Churchill. And Truman's excited, you know, he's excited too, that they're going to use this, that they could end the war, that they could bring all the troops home. The discussion moves to targets. One would assume that they would drop the bomb on Tokyo or Kyoto, another large city of incredible importance to the Japanese people. Paul Tibbetts talks about that decision-making process because he's in on all of this. Paul Tibbetts is at the top of the Manhattan Project planning. For 10 and a half months, he's working on this, on this one mission to end the war. Well, the question, while it was b being en route or being moved, yes. the question is, what will the target be? And I could say that there was all kinds of conjecture. Everybody made an, uh, some kind of a suggestion. And obviously, one of the most important ones was, well, why not Tokyo? Sure. Let's drop it on the Emperor's Palace. That'll impress them. And as I remember quite clearly, there was one gentleman out there who was thinking quite correctly, and that was Jimmy Doolittle. Jimmy Doolittle says, yes, if we do that, who are we going to make peace with? True. Yeah. What kind of condition was Tokyo in? Hadn't that been struck by a lot of uh, fire bombs in the months preceding that? Yes, Tokyo actually was nothing but rubble. And I don't know how many square miles, but I do know this, that in three nights of bombing, that there were more people killed in Tokyo than there were in Hiroshima and Nagasaki combined. Why was Hiroshima picked? What was going on in the war? What was going on in Japan? What is the thought process and the military reasoning behind picking this city, a seemingly somewhat random city in Japan? Only after that, that I had done some research, uh, additional research on my own and realized that, you know, I've always thought in the past, and maybe we, you've thought the same or others probably have thought the same, we didn't bomb Tokyo. No, why? Well, because it, I think my first thought is, well, it was the capital city, and you just don't do that. You know, you don't bomb the emperor's palace, like, et cetera. Actually, that wasn't really the reason. Uh, it it, it might have been a secondary reason, but uh, they had already made the decision that they were bombing civilians. In fact, a thing to understand about this atomic weaponry is that we had introduced firebombing into the war already, and that was having a devastating effect on many cities. No, it was not an atomic bomb. But I have to tell you, for the people on the ground, the effect was in a lot of cases the same because it was fires that you know, could not easily be put out on a city that was already taxed because it had been bombed. Tokyo had been completely bombed uh, throughout this phase of the war. And one of the reasons the generals decided not to do it, as in addition to those political calculations, is that there wasn't much left to bomb. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons you're seeing place like Kyoto, which actually was one of the key candidates, Nagasaki, Hiroshima, a few other cities, is that just like you might expect in any war, the Japanese are smart. They realize Tokyo is getting bombed. They're starting to pull businesses, uh, operations, manufacture of torpedoes to certain cities. Now, to be effective, these cities are going to have to be places that have ports where they can, there can be uh, embarking and where soldiers can come from and where material can get out to sea where most of the war is being fought. Uh, Hiroshima was a significant port city. It had right about the population, and this is a grim business, but at 310,000, this was a population that for the American generals, they're actually looking for a city where they could make an impact. Mm -hmm. You know, you think about this. You drop the bomb as they did in the test, like out in New Mexico. And then Truman gets back reports like, oh, this thing's very effective. It brought down a, a huge steel tower. It just disintegrated it. So we know it's going to happen when we drop it in a population area. 
But if you did that to Japan, if you say hit them with a warning shot in one of their rural areas, this is this is a country that's already been under attack. They're 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 in they're in a war situation. They're uh, as I referenced, like Tokyo's been Tokyo's been ruined. Now you drop something in a rural area just to show them, it's not going to impress. Yeah. And so one of the real grim calculations was they wanted a place with a lot of buildings, with a lot of metal, with a lot of material that would actually where you could see the impact from the moment the bomb was dropped. And Hiroshima had not been hit that hard mm -hmm. by any other American attack attack uh, to the area to to when after the bomb was dropped and they could see it coming from that one bomb and really make an impact. Yeah, Truman in his, point. in his diary, Truman says that he had instructed uh, them to look for military targets. There's a little bit of a broad sweep with that because they, the, the generals considered Hiroshima to be a military target. There was manufacture of weapons going on there and it was a, it was an embark point for soldiers and for naval ships and, and et cetera. So it was definitely uh, something that uh, contra controversial to some extent, you know, since then a lot of talk about it, but I don't think in 1945 um, it was really even, it was just one of the cities and they, they went with city, city B instead of city A. We got to stop here and ask, it was dropping the bomb necessary. Could we have ended the war another way? Because I believe simply bombing, as we were doing, bombing cities and taking islands and bombing the Japanese mainland, that wasn't going to work. We asked Bruce about the strategy to end the war and how bombing hadn't worked in places like England previously in the war. Look at, look at Britain and look at the bombing of London. And this, I think, is instructive for bombing in general. Always we get into these wars and, you know, you're, we're hit and we want to hit back. And that was something that as soon as they could do the Doolittle raid, there was a big boost for America that we could hit Japan. And yeah. the perception is always that the people on the ground are going to be so miserable that they're going to change the government and that they're going to hate what's going on. And you know, if you look at uh, the Western example of that is the is London and that bombing and they're hitting everywhere in London and people are in their shelters and, you know, uh, Winston Churchill's being moved, changing rooms, not staying in Downing Street all the time. Um, but the nation's surviving and the nation is fortifying as a result of this unfair attack from the sky, which is the way I think it's always seen. And it's very instructive. I think it's a lesson we learn. You know, and, and Churchill didn't learn it himself. He he wanted to do nothing but bomb Germany and make them feel the same pain. But I think we're forgetting that for civilians on the ground, it might even glue them closer to the uh, to the government rather than uh, say, oh, uh, these bombs are coming because our government's so bad. No, they're blaming the invaders from the sky who are fighting unfairly. And I think when you think about that and the nation of Japan and then add another the second thing to consider is that there was a kind of a religious government in effect with the emperor and the commitment of the Japanese to that emperor. Uh, and this is particularly true after the modernization of Japan and the, the emperor is seen as the person who has brought Japan from where it was, just a kind of island nation starting to get encroached on by Western powers to a dominant power in the Pacific. Yeah, he's a sitting god, at, he's a godlike figure in Japan. He is a godlike god figure both for religious reasons and political performance reasons because Japan's doing nothing but growing uh, during this period that would have been their lifetimes. It's clear that an invasion of mainland Japan was going to be necessary. The Japanese Empire, Emperor Hirohito, they're training men, women, children the elderly, to defend the island, to defend their homelands, city by city, block by block, house by house. It's going to be an incredibly, incredibly bloody, drawn-out process to finally get Japan to capitulate. Surrendering is just not in their DNA. It's a country that hasn't lost a war in a couple thousand years, basically. 
You know, Paul Tibbet said that he was saving lives. And that's how he justified what he did. This idea that you know, 250,000 at a minimum United States citizens or soldiers would have died. Many times that of Japanese soldiers and citizens would have perished in the fighting. As they prep for the, for the mainland invasion, many soldiers are moving from Europe and they're moving to the Pacific. They're coming home, but just for brief stays before they get on ships again in San Francisco in Los Angeles and in the West and begin shipping out to the Pacific. People like my grandpa would have had to go back to the war. Many of these soldiers credit Paul Tibbetts and the Manhattan Project and President Truman for making that difficult decision to drop the bomb and end the war. We asked Bruce, though, was there a non-nuclear resolution that could have been reached? Yeah, it's absolutely true. And Truman feels the exact same way, tells his wife, tells everyone uh, that uh, in in dropping that bomb and ending the war in this fashion, they're ending the war in the way that will save net lives. Um, obviously, Japanese lives will be lost, but they are they're at war with Japan and they're saving uh, a great number of American lives. You're right that the casualty estimates, now they're disputed, some of them, that maybe they were a little high. It's always, I think these always are a little higher in war when, it, when a general's informing a president about what could happen. Uh, so as high as a million. And now you consider that the invasion force is coming and they're going to fight uh, street by street. And they also think they have something on the Americans, and that's that it's going to take a while to build this invasion force. And I think this is another factor, too. No one wants a war to go on forever. So it looked like we probably weren't going to be able to execute a an invasion, you know, that quickly. It might even go into 1946. Yeah, I think so, they're, they're looking for maybe November as an in, early invasion date in 45. In the days leading up to the bombing, Truman's in Potsdam, and they release a statement between Stalin and Churchill, Britain and Russia, that unconditional surrender is the only condition that they'll accept for the Japanese. The Russians are preparing to to enter ground troops into Manchuria, into China, to open a two-front war against the Japanese, who were not just in Japan, they still dominated many of the countries of the Pacific Rim. Was this enough to win the war? We again asked Bruce about those conditions in the political and, and military situation as we go into August of 1945. Another factor to consider is and this is this is definitely a point of debate um is the entrance of russia into the war and russia could get troops onto japan much quicker oh, yeah. than the united states would be able to and they were very fearful for that they know they knew what was going on in berlin with uh, russian soldiers just butchering people and and not treating the inhabitants of conquered territories very well uh so cut a deal with the americans quick there was all that all of that procedure going on. The order is given, and on August 5th, meetings are held on the island of Tinian between Tibbets, the generals, his crew. The mission is a go. It's around this time that he names the ship the Enola Gay, after his mother. And he begins on August 6th, the morning of, to take off from Tinian at 2.45 in the morning. Some 100 people are waiting on the, on the runway to wave goodbye to him. The B-29, you know, it's seven tons overweight, basically. And as the Enola Gay races down the runway, pedal to the metal, full throttle, the plane's so heavy, it doesn't look like it's going to get up. Tibbets and the, and the plane use almost every inch of that runway before they finally lift off. The mission almost didn't even get started. God only knows what would happen if that plane had crashed. But he takes off at 2.45 in the morning and begins making his way to Japan. It's a many-hour trip. 
And Tibbetts admits that, that there were th- he had thoughts during the flight about the mission, its importance, how many people were, could be on the ground. Even, you know, about this mission, would he even come back? Is this a one-way flight? They told him they thought that the ship could survive the shockwave or the explosion and make it back, but no one really knows. He had thoughts, but he didn't have doubts about it. There's a reason they picked Colonel Paul Tibbetts, Columbus, Ohio native, for this mission. We asked Bruce about, about that trip, about what's going on maybe in, in Tibbetts' mind, um, and if this might be just a one-way trip. Pilots going in are there to do the mission. God bless you know our military, and, and their mentality has to be only one way. Um, you're going, we're going to succeed. I mean, I remember I had, uh, Kevin Lace on my uh, show. He's, he's an American sniper and he was, um, that's uh, a great episode. Yeah. Navy seal, a uh, great guy. And, um, he talks about in his book, how he's going up the stairs and for all he knows on this roof, it's going to be 10 weapons aimed at him. But you know what? You'd never have that mentality. You cannot have that. Your only mentality is I am hunter. You are hunted. I'm going to win. Mm -hmm. That's what you do when you go up the stairs. And I'm sure as much as I can be that that's what was on his mind. Bombing. um, It wouldn't have been so strange. Um, It wouldn't have been such uh, an enormous. uh, Well, I mean, it's hard to say it would have been an enormous uh, sacrifice. But I think if we're looking for the mentality or the mindset of that pilot, you have to understand that bombing over Germany, bombing over Japan, these bombing runs were highly risky. Many bombing crews did not come back. And when you entered a plane, you know, uh, you were you were almost defenseless. They had the gunners in the, you know, in the bottom there. There was a, uh, a high risk position to be in. And, uh, and and this was a this is a real, you know, on the mindset. And then this type of operation that very well could have uh, blown back in. And they, they had the calculations as to where he had to drop it and et cetera. But you never know, particularly when you're talking about things exploding underneath and, and what might have happened. And, yeah, I think it was uh, they were extremely pleased when he did come back. At 8.15 in the morning on August 6, 1945, 8.15 Hiroshima time, the Enola Gay has Hiroshima in its sights. They make one pass around the city. His bombardier, his hand-picked bombardier, is targeting the bridge in the center of town. It's the morning rush hour in Hiroshima. Tibbetts orders his men 30 seconds. He says, put goggles on. They had these sunglasses that they were supposed to wear to avoid looking and being blinded by the light, the flash. Five seconds. And the countdown, the the bomb doors open. And the bomb is dropped at 8.15 in the morning. And 40 seconds later, it explodes 1,900 feet over the city of Hiroshima, Japan. The atomic age has begun. Hiroshima and destroyed its usefulness to the enemy. That bomb has more power than 20,000 tons of TNT. The Japanese began the war from the air at Pearl Harbor. They have been repaid many fold, and the end is not yet. With this bomb, we have now added a new and revolutionary increase in destruction to supplement the growing power of our armed forces. In their present form, these bombs are now in production, and even more powerful forms are in development. It is an atomic bomb. It is a harnessing of the basic power of the universe. The force from which the sun draws its power has been loosed against those who brought war to the Far East. When the bomb left the airplane, of course, we were 10,000 pounds lighter right to start with. And what that did was gave me the opportunity to 
in terms of the vernacular, roll the airplane over on its side and pull it around in an unusually steep curve for mm -hmm. an airplane of that size and at that altitude. We were at 33,000 feet. Mm -hmm. But I practiced this time and time again and, and understood how to do it. So we did just exactly that very thing. As I made that turn and leveled that airplane out, my tail gunner sitting in the back says, here it comes. Well, he had seen the explosion before we did. He was the only one that could look directly at it. I see. And what he said was, here it comes, meaning here comes the shock wave, and that's what we wanted. How hard is that shock wave going to hit us? It had been predicted to be somewhere between two and three G-forces. Mm. It hit, we had an accelerometer in the airplane to measure, and the, the measurement turned out to be right at two and a half G-forces. So the airplane was built to take that. Now, in that time of that turn, my thought was, of course, getting the airplane around, but that was kind of a mechanical move. I kept thinking, is it going to explode before it should? Sure. That was the one thing that I was concerned with as far as safety is concerned. And when I was well into that turn, I figured, okay, the fusing mechanism's mm -hmm. working the way it's supposed to work. And actually, when the shock wave hit me, I said, there is success. By the time we turned around to look at it, there was nothing but a black boiling uh, mess hanging over the city and did actually obscuring everything but something on the outskirts. So you wouldn't have known that the city of Hiroshima was there unless you'd seen it coming in. 70,000 people die almost instantly. Nearly the entire city is leveled. Paul Tibbetts and his men have survived it. They survived the shockwave. And they began making their way back to Tinian, back to the base. Tibbetts says that he could, he could taste it. He could taste the bomb on his teeth. He had, he had cavities and he had fillings. And he said that he could taste it in, on his teeth. And they see that giant mushroom cloud on their way back it's after they make their turn. And they head back to base. Truman makes a statement on his way back from Potsdam. But the Japanese do not surrender. And August 6th goes by, and August 7th, and there's still no word from the Japanese. And on the 7th, you know, they do understand the devastation. On August 8th, the Russians announce that they're entering the war. They declare war on Japan, and they enter Manchuria. Stalin seeing the end of the war coming, wants to get his piece of Asia. The mission on August 9th goes through, and another bomb, Fat Man, is dropped. And it's dropped on the city of Nagasaki, not the original target. It changes mid-flight. And another 40,000 people die instantly. And still there's no surrender. We asked Bruce about, is there a third bomb what are the plans? We were so hopeful that, that this would end the war. But August 9th goes by and the 10th and the 11th, and there's still no surrender from the Japanese. Bruce, we talked to him about you know, the bomb's effects on the emperor and the military brass in Japan. And we talk about what if that, if that wasn't enough. You know, even an atomic bomb dropping in Hiroshima, well, we, we lost that. They, maybe they can't produce another one. And so we go right. to Nagasaki hitting a different part of Japan, the southern part, and saying, and this is, this is really what's devastating for the empire of Japan, is that we're telling you that not only uh, do we have this weapon, but we can now hit you in places where you thought you were safer. Like yeah. you took all your equipment and moved it away from the key bomb area. You know, imagine like America was attacked or like, and, and we figured, okay, New York falls. It's on the coast. Los Angeles falls. We're moving everything into Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. And then they find a weapon that can just take out Cincinnati. And that's exactly what happened to the empire of Japan. And then the third one had to be produced. It would have taken a few more weeks. Um, they had the ability, as you referenced that large Manhattan project, they had the ability to scale up production. So there very well could have been more bombs. And this is where presidential decision might have played more of a role. We don't think there would have been a third bomb. Uh, well, that's all speculation, but we think uh, they would have held the third once produced 
and then done several at once to really wow. injure. I mean, that's the first goal. It's not just to scare, but to injure the capacity of them to keep producing weapons and keep fighting, and then also to get the uh, the uh, the emperor and the ministry to see the effects and and come to reality. On August 14th, though, the Japanese do finally surrender. The war's over. The emperor speaks to his people, this godlike emperor Hirohito. The people have never heard his voice, and he tells them to surrender, that the, the ways of the world have gone against them. And although they fought valiantly, they can no longer go on. Generals of the Japanese army commit suicide in front of the emperor's palace. But back in America, Paul Tibbetts and the United States have won the war. VJ Day is its own celebrations throughout the country. We listen as President Truman announces the end of the war. And we ask Bruce about, just quickly, about VJ Day. And the mood of the country on August 14th when the Japanese finally lay down their arms. Oh, it's an enormous moment for America. Um... You know, uh, this is a simple way to look at it, but I guess my mind goes to the obscure things sometimes. Look at the music. Look at the 1945 um, music and the and the uh, explosion of some of the swing songs, like going from kind of more sad songs about GIs coming home in 42 and 43 to some of the um, uh, you know uh, some of the some of the swing music. And then the celebratory music that's that's out in 45 because because there was some celebration for VE Day alone. And despite this terrible task that was ahead with Japan, I think for the average American, they figure, well, we beat Japan, you know, we, we beat Germany, Japan's coming. You know, they didn't always realize how difficult all these calculations we're talking about might not have been known to the average public. So they thought things were wrapping up. It's an enormous moment. It's a, it's a celebration. The GIs are returning home. Harry S. Truman, four months after taking oath as president, leads his country finally to victory and peace. Mr. Truman and his cabinet meet in emergency session. Former Secretary Hull is on hand as the president breaks the momentous news of Japan's surrender. I have received this afternoon a message from the Japanese government in reply to the message forwarded to that government by the Secretary of State on August 11th. I deem this reply a full acceptance of the Potsdam Declaration which specifies the unconditional surrender of Japan. In the reply, there is no qualification. Arrangements are now being made for the formal signing of the surrender terms at the earliest possible moment. General Douglas MacArthur has been appointed the Supreme Allied Commander to receive the Japanese surrender. Great Britain, Russia, and China will be represented by high-ranking officers. Meantime, the Allied armed forces have been ordered to suspend offensive action. The nation of VJ Day must await upon the formal signing of the surrender terms by Japan. Newsmen rush the president's report to a waiting world. And through the early evening, Tuesday, August 14th, the fateful news is flashed. In New York City, as throughout a rejoicing nation and world, vast throngs of grateful, happy people celebrate the end of fighting, the dawn of peace. Two million New Yorkers jam Times Square. It's official. It's all over. It's total victory. It's my belief that Paul Tibbetts' mission on the Enola Gay and his crew and the dropping of, of, of Little Boy it's the most consequential military mission ever carried out, carried out by an Ohioan. And I asked Bruce, you know, what about maybe the Trojan horse mission or Pickett's charge? Um, but nothing really fits the bill. Nothing, nothing seems to have more lasting importance 
than this mission. Not just was it the most deadly and gruesome attack, but also it would have effects on the world for anywhere from hundreds of years. It still affects us today. I asked Bruce about that and about the importance of Paul Tibbetts' mission. I think it's I think it's would be hard to find an exact rival because it didn't affect in a multiple ways. When you look at the effect uh, an ending World War Two, and then also the the impact on the Cold War, yeah. and then the fact that you know, and this is really hard to imagine. We 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 take it for granted almost, but there was Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and that that is 1945. And that is, and I am definitely knocking on wood as I'm talking to you, uh, the last time these weapons are used in a, in a military, for a military reason. And yeah, when you think about that, it, and, and this is going to sound a little, this is definitely a little Americanism, and someone listening from another country in the world might disagree with, with talking this way, but I agree with Truman, you know, thank God we had it and somebody else didn't, because it has turned out that as much as the weapons have proliferated, those two uses of it were, were the last uses. Again, knocking on wood. And I don't know if, if another country had been the, the possessor of it, if that would have happened. Current nuclear weapons, these giant hydrogen bombs, have a yield of 50 megatons. That's 50 million tons of TNT. We heard Truman announce that we had dropped a bomb of about 20,000 tons of TNT. These bombs are somewhere about 3,000 times more powerful. Think about that. 3,000 times more powerful than the bomb that Paul Tibbetts dropped on Hiroshima. Tibbetts lives out his life in Columbus. He becomes a general, and he becomes more outspoken about his mission and about what he did in 1945 as he gets older. He believes he saved lives. He believes that war is ugly. It's an ugly, horrible business. And what Paul Tibbetts did ended that ugliness. It ended the death and destruction. We listen to Tibbetts as he explains how he feels about the mission of the Enola Gay. Look, at her. civilians have been killed in every war. Now, it depends upon how they are killed. Now, with that situation, uh, I am supposed to have lost sleep over what I did, have a certain amount of morose and, mm -hmm. and so forth. And I can assure you I've never lost a night's sleep on the deal. 1948, Paul Tibbetts is working at the Pentagon. And he gets a notice from the, uh, the Air Force Chief of Staff that him and General Jimmy Doolittle, Colonel uh, Dave Schillen, they get word from the president that they're supposed to go over to his office immediately. And they get there, and the seats are all arranged. They're given some coffee. And Tibbetts is given a seat directly next to the president behind the Resolute Desk in the Oval Office. Just to the president's left. And Truman comes in, and they all start talking. It's, again, it's 1948, and he asks everyone to sit down. And he talks you know, to Doolittle and to, and to General Spates and congratulating them on, on their incredible careers. And he looks at Paul Tibbetts. And Tibbetts says that he looked at him for like 10 seconds and didn't say anything. And he finally says to him, what do you think? And Tibbetts says, Mr. President, I think I did what I was told. I think I did what I was told. And Truman smacks his hand on the desk. He's a fiery little guy. He's running for re-election in 48. You can go back and listen to our, our second episode, Ohio versus the Electoral College, to hear more about President Truman. Or read our book recommendation for today about, about Truman here in 1945. President Truman's a pretty incredible guy, as I read more and more about him, not just for this episode, but just for fun. And Truman says... He says, you're damn right you did. And I'm the guy who sent you. And if anybody gives you a hard time, you refer him to me. Tibbetts walks out of the office and he continues an incredible, incredibly decorated career in the United States Air Force. And he lives out the rest of his life in Columbus, Ohio. Truman 
Truman never changed his mind either. He called the bomb a terrible success. And at no point in the rest of his life, and Truman lives for many years. He lives for 20 years after he's out of office. Dies at 88 in Kansas City. But he never changed his mind about the mission, and that he made the right call. But people still debate it today. We asked Bruce about some of those con- you know, counterpoints to, to the dropping of the bomb, including the fact that now we live in this nuclear age where there's missiles pointed at, at each other every single day and how we're one slip up away from thermonuclear war. I know I'm com- it's heavy. Episode one here, season two, is a heavy one. But we live in this nuclear age today. And we have the power to make the world uninhabitable. We have the power to end human life. We talked to Bruce just about the counterpoint. Was there another way? And what, what this new nuclear age that Paul Tibbetts brought on us, what it means. You, you do hear, oh, we sh-, you know, this was a terrible event and we shouldn't have done it. Um, yeah, Truman calls it a terrible success. A terrible success, and I think because it's a one event, but there was a lot of cities being burned and and bombing and destruction, and long ago the decision had been made to start bombing Hamburg and Berlin and places like that. Dresden, yeah. And uh, that 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 those those decisions are made in in during war, and then to have twenty or thirty years later. And of course, there's survivors and there's other voices, um, you know, to have this kind of like hindsight type history done. I think that's fine as long as you're bringing yourself into the point of view. Now, I have heard a, a theory, for instance, as a Japanese historian, who, you know, it, referencing my earlier point about Stalin was coming into the war and saying that it was unnecessary because Stalin was coming into the war and they the Japanese would have surrendered anyway that's a really I think all of these type of answers are speculative Tibbetts lives till he's 92 years old Like I said, he became much more outspoken in his later years. He dies in Columbus, Ohio, and he requests no funeral. And General Tibbetts requests no burial, no gravestone. Those those were his requests. He did not want to give a place for protesters to gather, either after his death or in the future. A place where his life and his mission could be politicized for people that he firmly completely did not agree with. We asked Bruce just about about the end of of Paul Tibbetts' life, his legacy, and just the role of history. And it is that that's tragic, by the way, that somebody who um, contributed so much would have to feel that way. And and we hope that there's there's a there's a way that that can that can change um, in the future. Yeah, well, I think that it's important because you and I, we both have podcasts that delve into history and why is it important? Because it provides lessons for today. And sometimes done too quickly, done badly, we get bad lessons from a quick history. And so it's important to really look at the circumstances and to get yourself in the shoes of those people at that time and to look at the human actors and not just kind of the real quick textbook history. There's a reason for textbook history, and that's because you got U.S. History one and U.S. History two, and what you know, ninth or tenth grade. Got to go quick. You got to get it. You got to get it done. It's not their fault. It's not the textbook's fault. It's it's we shouldn't as adults be stopping the learning there. We should read more books and investigate. And as you can you can see. Reading the contemporary accounts or reading books about those times, there's so um, little evidence that anything else is really possible. We're going to leave you with the words of Paul Tibbetts. To some, an American hero who ended World War II, saved hundreds of thousands of lives, not just American lives, Japanese lives, 
Soviet lives, Australian lives, or some can consider him to be the worst terrorist, the worst murderer in world history. A man who dropped one weapon that killed, within a few months, 140,000 people. An interviewer asks him if he has trouble sleeping at night. I was clearly convinced in my own mind, and I had people telling me how much property and lives that bomb would take when it exploded, because it was non-discriminatory. It took yes. everything. I made up my mind then that the morality of dropping that bomb was not my business. I was instructed to perform a military mission to drop the bomb, and that mm -hmm. was the thing that I was going to do to the best of my ability. Morality, there is no such thing in warfare. I don't care what, whether you're dropping atom bombs or whether you're dropping 100-pound uh, bombs there's, or you're shooting a rifle. Mm -hmm. there, you got to leave the moral issue sure. out of it. From Garfield's tomb to the Serpent Mound From the big cities to the river towns First in flight making history There's so many books you need to see I like reading And I like reading Tippecanoe and Tyler too From the Queen City to Lake Erie Blue Edison and a man on the moon so many books, which will we choose? I like reading I like reading Our book recommendation for today, uh, it's a book we got by listening to My History Can Beat Up Your Politics, Bruce Carlson's awesome podcast. He interviewed the author A.J. Bame who recently wrote the book The Accidental President, Harry S. Truman in the Four Months That Changed the World. Uh, it just got released on Audible, um, so if you download, you want to listen to books that way. It just got released uh, at the end of October, and it's an incredible book that looks at this time. It looks at April 1945 to August 1945, the same time period that we talked about today. Great book. At the very least, go back and listen to Bruce's episode from a couple weeks back where he interviews the author, A.J. Bame, and they talk about Truman and the bomb and the Russians uh, and all that, the, all those four months where Truman went from being a vice president completely shut out of FDR's cabinet to becoming the most powerful man in the history of the world. Again, we want to thank Bruce. Go to myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. All the episodes are there. iTunes, subscribe to it. He has a premium podcast for two bucks a month um, where you can get even more content, more episodes. It really is one of the most fun, one of the most th well thought out, well done history podcasts on the internet. Um, he is a huge idol of mine when it comes to, to podcasting. I'm so glad he was able to join us. So we even sent him a little Ohio V the World t-shirt this week uh, to thank him for joining us. And we're going to have him back. Um, and it looks like that'll be episode five or six of this season. So again, thanks to Bruce. Uh, go listen to his episode, recent one with Chris Matthews, uh, talking about his book about RFK. Um, again, my history can beat up your politics. iTunes that subscribe. It's a great one. Anyways, guys, we're happy to be back. Uh, don't forget the launch party. Season two is underway. The launch party is Saturday in Grandview at the Columbus Italian Club. Um, again, go to Facebook to our page to look up uh, directions and info on that. It is a cash-only party when it comes to drinks, so there is an ATM on site, but remember to bring some cash with you, uh, and we will have music and food. This Sunday, the 19th, you can catch me on 610 WTVN in Columbus on the show For the Defense. Again, that's Sunday on 610 WTVN between 11 a.m. and 12 p.m. Thanks to Jason McCormick. Jason Lee McCormick, one of my best friends from growing up, uh, who provided some of the music and will be doing a lot of music for us here in season two. Uh, Jason is a great musician, lives out in Portland, Oregon. He's a pilot out there, um, an awesome dude, great guitar player. We went and saw him a couple weeks ago for a wedding out in Oregon. Me and Miss Ohio V. The World had a great time, um, and he's agreed to just 
give us some of these cuts, some of our bump music, and he's one of the best, one of my favorite guys to ever play music with. And check out Jason's new album, Into Echoes. You can find it at jasonleemccormick.bandcamp.com. And again, that's jasonleemccormick.bandcamp.com. We'll be back with episode two on Saturday. And again, episode three starting Monday. We are going to have a regular schedule on the show. I think our listeners will be happy to hear that. I know we normally would just release one randomly every two or three weeks. Um, We're going to try to release them on Sunday nights slash Monday mornings. Every other Sunday, every other Monday morning. Um, For season season two, we're doing another 15 episodes. um, And we'll take a break, you know, over this summer. So thank you guys so much for listening. Paul Tibbetts. American superhero or merchant of death. I leave that for you to decide. But what I ask you to do is when you consider this, think about this episode. We try to put it in the context of 1945. Yes, he's the first person to drop an atom bomb. But think about it in the context of August of 1945, not in the context of the fall of 2017. We'll lighten up a little bit in the next episode. Um... And we're going to talk about the war between Ohio and Michigan. We're going to have a Michigan man, John Shirk, on with us. And we're going to talk about the Toledo War, as we're just a week, two weeks away from Ohio State, Michigan. The game. The greatest rivalry in sports. Uh, And we'll talk about, go back to the 1830s, when when these two states went to war with each other over Toledo. So really looking forward to that episode. Guys, thank you so much. Ohio V the World is back. Season 2. Rate and review us. Check us out. Follow us on Instagram. Like us on Facebook. Uh, We are Ohio V the World Podcast on Instagram. Uh, Go to the website, OhioVTheWorldPodcast.com. Email me at OhioVTheWorld at gmail.com. If you have show ideas, uh, we have t-shirts to sell. Uh, I'll put those up on the website as well. Or just email me. Um, They're just 20 bucks and we'll get them out to you. So great to have you back. We'll see you guys soon. Take it easy. I can look to you.